Redeemer. Amen. Lord, please send someone else. Right? How many times did Moses ask to get out of this? Count them again. I hear three. Three is the wrong answer. It's at least four. It's at least four. Because there's four in our reading this morning and we skip around a lot. But before we get to our reading this morning, we have to fill in some spots here, right? Because last week we left off with Jacob in this ladder and God making himself be known to Jacob. So how did we get to Egypt and to Moses? Well, in this, right, Jacob had how many kids? Twelve. And they became the twelve tribes of Israel, right? And one of those tribes was... No, actually it wasn't. Joseph's two kids became one of the tribes. That was a trick question. But yes, that's the name I was looking for. Joseph. (laughs) Joseph was one of Jacob's children, right? Joseph was actually the... Parents, you're not supposed to have a favorite. Joseph was the favorite child, right? Out of 12, he got the coat of many colors. His brothers hated him. They sold him into slavery. He went to Egypt. He actually wound up saving all of the world, right? Because of his great um, wisdom in keeping them safe through the famine. So Joseph saves all of the world, saves his family. His family moves to Egypt. And then the king that used to love Joseph dies. And the new Pharaoh puts all of Israel into slavery. So here we are with Moses in Egypt and slavery. And before we get to Moses seeing this burning bush today, we have to also remember a part of Moses' life which we don't want to talk about all the time, right? Moses was raised by whose family? Pharaoh's family. And as he was raised up, he, he saw what the, what the Egyptians were doing to the Israelites and what happened. He killed one. He, he accidentally, or on purpose, we don't really know which, I wouldn't say killed. He killed an Egyptian soldier who was um, maybe taking it too much on an Israelite slave. So that's why Moses fled. And Moses is in the wilderness. Which brings us to our story today. Where God sees his people and notices his people, right? The end of chapter 2 there, it says, And after a long time the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of slavery, their cry for help rose to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In verse 25, God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. It's a very good trans, not a very good translation of what the text actually says, right? God took notice of them. The Hebrew, the Hebrew actually says there that God knows his people, right? God looked upon the Israelites and God knew his people and he wanted to help them. He'd heard their cries and he wanted to help them. So then he sends Moses and in order to send Moses, what does he do? He starts a bush on fire. My question is... How long had that bush been burning before Moses saw it? How many of you would notice a bush if it was burning and wasn't being consumed by the fire? I saw one hand go up. (laughs) But would we? Because here's the thing, right? Verse 4 there in chapter 3 says, I think it's verse 4. Yes, because Moses saw the bush. He was on the mountain in Horeb. He saw the bush. He said, gee, I, this is an interesting sight. I need to turn around and look at this. So he turns around and he looks at it. And verse four says, he just had it and I lost it. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see it, then God called out to him, Moses, Moses. How long was this bush burning? Before Moses actually saw it. Because God waited for Moses to notice it. Until he did anything about it. And then when he's talking to Moses. He says Moses I need you to go and do this. And what does Moses say? Now this is the first time that he says. Not for me. Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh. Well who is he? 
Because who is Pharaoh now? This is a history lesson. This is all our history's lesson, right? The former king that loved Joseph died. The new Pharaoh came into power. And actually, in the meantime here, has passed away as well. And Moses was raised by Pharaoh. And the new Pharaoh that is in power now was his brother. So when Moses says, who am I to go? You're the brother of Pharaoh. That's who you are to go. And then he says, so, but who am I supposed to tell them sends me? It's not enough for him that God has already introduced himself, right? He says, Moses, Moses, here I am. Come no closer because the ground you are on is holy ground. Remove your sandals. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. What, what more do you need to know who this, who this God is? He's already explained to you who he is. So why does he need to ask his name? But Moses doesn't want to go. Right? So he asks, Who am I supposed to say sent me? And God says, I will be who I am. Actually, not I am who I am. But the word therefore, I am or to be. To be is actually the, the name of God. The, the name that we're not supposed to pronounce. The name that um, Jews will never say because it's always translated in the Old Testament as Lord or Adonai or Elohim. It's never actually said the name of God. And why is that? <coughs> Confirmation students, you just learned it on Wednesday. Who was listening? I think we need to repeat the lesson. Why don't the Jews ever say the name of God? Right, so they can't break the commandments. If I never say the name of God, I can't possibly break the second commandment. But the name of God is the Tetragrammatron. It's your big word for the day. Tetragrammaton. Don't ask me to spell it. It's four letters is the name of God, and it mimics the sound of breathing. Yod, He, Va, He are the four letters of the name of God. Yod, He, Va, He. And it kind of mimics the sound of what it is to breathe because God is all about relations, because God is the God of who? I am the God of your father, and I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Is are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive? No. At this point, they're not. But God is the, is the God of Abraham. Not I was the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham. He's a God of relations. He's a God that wants to be with us and constantly working in us. And Moses doesn't want to have this. Moses doesn't want to believe this. Moses doesn't want to have any part of this. Even after he gets his answers, his questions answered, he still is going on that he doesn't want to go. And I bet if we were to read chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, we'd find number 5 of Moses questioning God. Right? We got one here with, with who am I to go? Two with what is your name? Three comes in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4. And then we get to verse... 10 in chapter 4. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I've never been eloquent in the past or even spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Meaning, I don't speak well. So send somebody else. And finally, when all of these requests come down to naught and God still is going to send him, Moses finally just says, Oh Lord, send somebody else. And you know what? I understand exactly what Moses is saying. No, God, this is not what it's going to be. This is not the way it's going to happen. You just need to figure this out and send somebody else. Because I'm not going to do that. Right? I bet if you, if you ask any pastor that you know 
to tell you their call story, they'll have at least one handful of times that they told God, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going there. It's not going to happen. Because we don't want to do what God is calling us to do. Because we're scared. And we don't think that we're able to do it. And we don't think that we can speak out in front of other people. We don't think that we can share our faith. Do you know what? If you look at the list of people in the Old Testament that we're supposed to look at as, as pillars of our faith, as people who were always there, that always did the right thing, and if you look at them and look at their lives, you're going to see that they're just the biggest screw-up as any of the rest of us are, and that we're holding them on a higher pedestal because that's what we've been taught to do. But if you actually look at their stories, they're no different than you. No one is different than us. We all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. And God is calling each and every one of us to do something. God is calling each and every one of us to go and to do something for Him. God is calling each and every one of us to stand up and to speak for injustice when we see it. God is calling each and every one of us to stand up and to share our faith in a world that needs to hear about a God who loves them. God is calling each and every one of us. To do the thing that we don't think we can do because he's given us the gifts and is going to empower us and stand by us and give us the means to do the things that he needs and knows that we can do. There's a song by Peter Ide that my daughter out there would say, why do you have to read the lyrics? Why can't you play the song? But I didn't play the song. So the song is... Does anybody know what song I'm going to? If Carrie was in here, she would know. Do you know the song? <laughs> what, what, what song of Peter I talks about, about people doing wrong things? Oh, yes, you do. Well, the song is, since I put her on the spot and she didn't get it. As is. Right? God takes us and... <laughs> God takes us and uses us as we are because that's the way we need to be, right? The lyrics to the song are, Moses was a stutterer, David was a murderer, Jeremiah suicidal, naked in the streets. Paul had a problem with specifics left unsaid. Timothy had stomach aches and Lazarus was dead. Samson was a long-haired, arrogant womanizer. Rahab was a scarlet-corded lady of the street. John the Baptist eating bugs and honey on his bread. And Gideon was a scaredy cat and Lazarus was dead. Noah was a drunk man. Abraham was an old man. Jacob was a lying man. Leah was second best. Jonah should have followed, followed God but ran away instead. Martha was a worrywart and Lazarus was dead. Right? All of these people that we look at as pillars of our faith all had issues. They all did something wrong. They all had weaknesses. And that's, those are there to show us that those people are just like us. We all have our weaknesses, but God can work in and through that and use us just as we are. Just as he used Moses, just as he used Noah, just as he used David, just as he used Jeremiah, just as he used everybody else that we read about in the Bible. God will use you too. Not that, just like I told the kids up here, not that God can use you, because yes, God can use you, but God will use you. There's no question. Because he uses us as is, the chorus of the song, as is, as is, he chooses us as his, as his, as his, infuses us as is. Never ending love transcending all our weaknesses, no excuses, he uses us as is. Just like Moses, God is going to use you. So ask him all the times you want to not send you. But you know what? He's still going to send you. Because he's equipped you. And he's given you the gifts that you need to use in the world. And more importantly, beyond all that, he loves you. And he will always be with you. Because he is the God of your father. He is the God of Abraham. He is the God of... Isaac, he's the God of Jacob, and he is your God. And he is always with you. So never question whether God can use you. Because he can, and he will. And he'll use you just as you are right now.
to share His love in a world that so desperately needs to hear it.